evening everyone. I thought that it would be a good idea for us to reflect on the topic of spirituality from a Baha'i perspective because of several reasons. First of all, spirituality is a very uh, confusing concept. And there are so many different understandings of spirituality in our world today. And uh, uh, different opinions, that's number one. Another reason is that many people mistake spirituality with religiosity. They think if you're religious, you are spiritual, which is not necessarily true. We see in our world so many religious people who are furthest from spiritual quality. And throughout history, that has been The third reason is that people think that you can become a spiritual in the absence of God in your life, in communion with nature, in uh, creativity, in your dreams, in your rituals, it doesn't matter what, that somehow you can become spiritual in the absence of a fundamental relationship with God. The vehicle of which, of course, throughout history has been religion. There are other reasons, but these are the three reasons that come immediately to mind about the concept of spirituality and what uh, we can learn about it from writings of the Baha'i faith. And in this respect, of course, is very important because definitely the Baha'i faith, the writings of the Baha'i faith, call upon us to uh, develop a spiritual lifestyle and live a spiritual way. And within the Baha'i community, also I have noticed that there are many diverse views of what is spirituality. And many people also mistake spirituality with emotionality. If you are crying, and you are uh, soft speaking, and tender, you're spiritual being, if you're the otherwise, you're not, and that all kind of notions about spirituality. So, with this in mind, we, uh, I try to share with you some thoughts on what I understand on some of the aspects of the concept of spirituality from the perspective of the Baha'i faith. These are my personal understanding. The dynamics of relationship between God and humanity are continuous and never ceasing and ever present. In other words, whether we believe in God or don't believe in God, whether we accept God, whether we don't, whether we like him or don't, doesn't matter what. God has created us. God is present in human life. God provides everything. 
for our living and for the existence. And regardless of whether we accept it or not, God will continue to be loving and caring about humanity. This is a reality. A reality that adolescent humanity has rejected it and child humanity in the stages of childhood has misunderstood it. And therefore we have two groups of people in the world right now, primarily those who misunderstand the nature of relationship of humanity with God and see God as an angry, as an aggressive, as a punitive, as a violent a superpower. And those who believe that the God, God doesn't exist, or if exist, it really is irrelevant to the world of humanity because God allows so much problem to be in our world. So these are basically the views, and there are a lot of books written about it. If you go and into library or bookstore, you will see a lot of the denial of God, rejection of God, the delusion of God, the illusion of God. It doesn't matter what they are all there. Okay. Now. The dynamics of relationship of God with humanity has, it, it takes place on the uh, arc of a descent and arc of ascent. It's this way. Arc of descent refers to what God gives to humanity which is, of course, first our life and everything that goes with it. And second is the revelation. God sends his messengers, his manifestations, systematically, regularly, as needed to humanity. And they come and they give the necessary teachings and guidance to humanity for the time and place as appropriate and as needed by humanity at that time and at that place. And the second is that through the revelation, God also provides an example the example of the manifestation himself and the example of the few <coughs> unique individuals um, assigned as such by the manifestation as example. For example, in the Baha'i faith, we have the example of Baha'u'llah. And we have the Abdul Baha, who is the perfect exemplar for Baha'is to live their lives following his example. Okay. And the third thing that the, these are all most uniquely appropriate to the Baha'i faith. The third component of the Ark of Descent is the covenant that God establishes through the revelation a covenant between himself, between God and humanity, an agreement. And the agreement fundamentally is that God, through his love, provides the necessary guidance and gives us freedom to follow it or not, to accept it or to reject it. 
And whatever happens after that is the outcome, the result of our response. Okay. So the arc of descent involves revelation, the example, and the karma. The arc of ascent is the human response to the revelation, which uh, has several components and several stages. The immediate stage is dramatic opposition of those in position of power and authority and the ignorant masses. This has happened throughout history in all religions. That manifestation of God comes and humanity thus far having gone through its uh, collective childhood and now a, a collective adolescence has rejected the manifestation and uh, has been violent towards the manifestation. So what they did to Jesus or to Muhammad or to Moses or to the Bab or Baha'u'llah or to Zoroaster, all of them, it's that story repeats itself. But at the same time, there are certain individuals whose soul is ready, whose spirit is ready, and they respond. They become the dawn breakers. They become apostles. They, they, they let go of, of everything and accept the new revelation. This drama has happened over and over again. And early believers, and to a certain degree, we are still, we are also among the early believers, um, immediately respond to the revelation uh, through the practice of spiritual uh, ordinances that religion gives, the manifestation revelation gives. Uh, most specifically, we connect individually very fast, reconnect individually very fast with God through the new manifestation. And that we do through prayers, through meditation, through fasting. Those are the three major ways in which we as individuals begin our journey on the arc of ascent towards God. Okay? And when we look at the Baha'i writings, and especially when we look at the Baha'i prayers, and especially when we look at the Baha'i obligatory prayers, we see that all of them fundamentally are focused on reiteration of our love for God and rejection of uh, the uh, insistent self which uh, wants to be uh, uh, focused on the immediate gratification of uh, one's desires. Uh, these are physical desires as well as interpersonal desires and so forth. So that, that is the immediate spiritual response. But that response doesn't mean that we as individuals transform. Because transformation has to take place in the level of psyche, in the level of the soul. Psyche and soul the same. And transformation, therefore, has to have an psychological and sociological uh, components. And the new teachings that come 
is to help us to change our psychological and social modes of behavior, of thinking, of showing emotions and feelings, and establishing relationships, and so forth. Okay. And uh, this process in the Baha'i faith, in order for us to develop this psychosocial understanding <clears throat> and then go through a transformation revolves around the concept of unity. We have to understand unity. We have to be able to create inner unity between our thoughts, feelings, and actions, and between us and life, and between us and other people, and between us and God. And we need to express it in all, all areas of life. For example, we have to develop the concept of oneness. We have to become conscious of the reality of the oneness of humanity. We have to be actively involved in gender, creating gender equality and stimulating with women and men on equal basis, on other races, on equal basis, on other classes of people on equal basis. We have to actively focus on understanding how to bring science and religion in harmony with each other, and on and on. And we have to understand how to create a system of economy that would abolish extremes of wealth and poverty. All of these are different expressions of application of the law of unity to our lives. And, and when we look at ourselves, at least when I look at myself, I realize how far I am from this transformation that has to take that it's not enough to say, I am a Baha'i, and I say my prayers, and I uh, fast, and I meditate, and read the writings, and talk a little bit about being friendly and unified. It's not enough. We have to, make, to, we have to bring about a fundamental transformation in our life. This is the pathway toward the spirituality. And that transformation based on the fundamental concept of unity is going to take time. It's going to take time. It's a gradual process. Right now, Baha'is around the world are much more influenced by the cultures that they come from than the transformation that Baha'u'llah calls upon us to be. So if you're in a Canadian setting, you're more Canadian than Baha'i. If you're Persian, you're more Persian than Baha'i. If you're Swiss, you're more Swiss, much more Swiss than your Baha'is, and on and on and on. That's a reality, because it is a gradual process. That, so. The, the first and the immediate is we put, that we put into practice certain of the teachings. But the next one is to work on ourselves to transform our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, and bring them into this new mode of functioning. And that one, new mode of life. And that one takes generations. Hopefully, every new generation, the children of every new gen generation, would be more advanced in this arc of ascent than the ones before. Okay. And then again, this is the gradual process. And then there is a slower process. And that slower process 
is the process of social political transformation, creation of a new civilization. Baha'u'llah has come to establish a civilization of peace. And therefore, that's going to take much longer. It's, it's, we have to first bring about that inner transformation, then that interpersonal transformation within our families and friendships and places of work and so forth. And then we would gradually begin to do the transformation at the political, social level, at the highest level. And at the core of that process is learning how to function within the framework of justice. And that's why the Baha'i administration is based on the concept of justice. The Baha'i institutions that run the social life of the Baha'i community are the spiritual assemblies that when they become mature, they will be houses of justice. And we have to have them local houses of justice, national houses of justice, and then universal houses of justice. We are far from that. We are not in that stage. Justice is essential. You see, the human society never has been just. Justice has not existed in human life. Injustice has been always there. And we see it now far more present because we are more, far more aware of it, and also we have the far more power to bring about injustice upon us. And the cry of humanity always has been for justice. Issues of equality and freedom and all of those fall under the umbrella of justice. And once we begin to administer human affairs within the framework of justice, once we begin to consciously try to become just individuals and to defend justice for everybody and become social agents of justice. Once we learn that, then we would be able to, to go towards the establishment of peace, which first would be the lesser peace which is the political peace, and then would be the most great peace, which is the wholesome, the comprehensive peace. Peace among nations, peace among races, peace among genders, uh, different genders, and peace between religions. And that's going to take time, you see. So, so when human response to revelation, our response to revelation of Baha'u'llah, which is the pathway of our spirituality, is, is, has this immediate, <clears throat> gradual, and long-term, slow process. And we, we have to be conscious of those and work on all of them at the same time, realizing that one is more immediately accessible, but the others less so, and then others more so. Okay, so that's the process. Now, in the, of course, connected with this process, of course, is uh, the way that we have responded to the manifestation and the world of humanity the way that has responded to Baha'u'llah has been absolutely lamentable. It is most lamentable and the most ominous for immediate life of humanity because the manifestation of God has come for this age. His teachings have come when people with an open mind listen to them and focus
use of the, they realize their applicability to the needs of humanity today. But we have to put it in the data. And the, the three groups that have actively ignored <coughs> it are, of course, first and foremost, religious leaders. They have ignored it. But the second group that they have ignored it, and it's really ominous, are academics. Academics are, it's amazing how ignorant they are about the Baha'i faith. It's just amazing when I talk with people who are the PhD in religious studies and this and that, and when you talk with them and you will see they're totally ignorant. And misinformed. This, these are, these are the examples. These are the indications of what is happening in our world today, uh, because, because of the veils that are there between uh, human mind at this level of its development and preoccupations, and the light of the spiritual, spiritual center that has gone, and is there. And then, of course, is the issue of the covenant. The humanity in the past has had a very bad story, bad record of their covenant with their, with their manifestations. Look, look what Muslims did. Muslims broke the covenant between them and Prophet Muhammad, the moment that Prophet Muhammad died, the moment he died, Islam divided. Shia and Sunni. And that division has continued. And now we see the expression of it in its most dramatic this is the consequence, uh, consequence of the violation of the covenant of man with human and with God. When we violate our covenant, we break our words, we don't follow our responsibility. And here, with regard to our relationship with God, the consequences are ominous. The same happened to Christianity. You just think of history of what Christianity has done in that regard. Think of the dark ages of Christianity. Think of crusades. Think of wars between Protestants and Catholics. Think of what they have done with the schools and with the colonial rules and with the places that they went. They just think of what has happened. And every religion that you go, you see that has been the case. Now, because we are approaching the age of maturation of humanity, Baha'u'llah made his covenant very clear, very specific, and very strong. So that's the reason that almost 200 years gone, and the Baha'i faith is completely united, and will remain united, because this is the sign of maturation of humanity. The fundamental sign of maturation in the spiritual realm is the ability to maintain the covenant. If we don't do that, we violate the fundamental law of existence, which is unity. There is no way we can be spiritual. We cannot be a conflicting person, or a conflicted person, or a conflict-creating person, and be spiritual. It is impossible. We cannot 
follow the standards of truth and think that we are spiritual. Covenant requires that we accept the truth and stick with it, even if it means that we have to give our lives. And that's what we see with the Baha'is in Iran. That's what we see now. Okay. So that's, that's a fundamental process. So human response on the arc of ascent is a response to revelation, response to manifestation, and response to the covenant. So how we, are, we put these things together in the everyday life then comes the question. And Baha'u'llah gives us a few uh, advice, simple explanations that we have to follow. A manifestation of God is at once a divine physician and a divine educator. The manifestation of God comes diagnoses the illness of humanity, prescribes the remedy, and educates us how to use that remedy. Okay. That's, that's the way the divine manifestation, divine physician, and divine educator work. So, Baha'u'llah says that we should be consciously aware of the needs of the time in which we live. He said we exhort mankind in these days when the countenance of justice is soiled with dust. Okay. Remember justice? When the flames of unbelief of burning high and the robe of wisdom rent asunder. These are the conditions of the world. Justice is not there. Unbelief is on ascendancy. And there is no wisdom on the part of the wise of the world. Okay. When tranquility and faithfulness have ebbed away, and trials and tribulations have waxed severe, when covenants are broken, and ties are severed when no man knoweth how to discern light and darkness or to distinguish guidance from error. This is the condition of our world today. But how not find these guys? This is the condition of the world. Okay? This, by the way, this is, is uh, paragraph was from Tablet of Wisdom. So you can go and look at it. So this is the condition of the world. Another way of looking at the condition of the world, because we have to diagnose what is happening in the world in order to, to transform ourselves and help humanity to, to begin to consider a new way of relating to God. Okay. Uh, humanity is suffering from 
leprosy of soul. See, leprosy is a very unusual disease. Leprosy is a disease in which you lose your capacity to feel with your fingers and your extremities and so forth. You no longer have the feeling. That's the reason that the lepers become disfigured. They break, they cut their fingers, they cut their legs, their nose, this and that. They don't feel it. They don't feel pain. When you don't feel pain, you don't protect yourself. Pain is necessary for protection of self. Okay? Uh, so when we have a leprosy of soul is that we our thoughts become distant and indifferent our thoughts are not compassionate look at the way that uh, economic systems of the world are handled by uh, World Bank and IMF and those countries in Europe right now. You see, they, they say, well, economically, you have to fire two-thirds of the employees of the government because there is no money. But what people are going to do? What, what's going to happen to them? They have to live, okay? The phenomenon of what is happening in Greece or many other places happen is when no longer people's intellectual properties and capacities have the ability to be sensitive to the needs of people, to the suffering of people. Emotionally, when we become leper, we don't have compassion. We don't have the feeling of closeness and connectedness with others. We become indifferent. We become indifferent to the suffering of humanity. We focus on ourselves. And when it comes to our decisions, you see there are powers of human soul, our thoughts, our feelings, our will, our actions. Our actions also become indifferent. We, did, we do things only and only we focus on ourselves and our immediate family and immediate condition. We don't become universal in our, because the, one of the fundamental characteristic of the spiritualization is universality, to become universal. <clears throat> And we don't become universal, we become limited. Our universe becomes very, very limited. So when Jesus treated the lepers, it was those who had leprosy of soul in his time, and he cured them. Okay? We have, you know, people think that it was the medical leprosy that Jesus treated. No, it was the leprosy of the soul. Now the same thing is happening this time. We have a leprosy of soul. It is the most acute form in our world today. And it is in that condition that the revelation comes in order to cure. And we become the agents in bringing the remedy. Baha'u'llah says, Walk thou high above the world of being. Through the power of the most great name, power, the revelation. That thou mayest become aware of the immemorial mysteries and be acquainted with the where we because with that wherewith no one is acquainted. In other words, 
if we want to understand what to do, we have to begin to immerse ourselves in prayers, in meditation, in a study of the revelation, in conscious effort to raise ourselves above the day-to-day -day preoccupations of life, to become forgetful of self and become ever mindful of our humanity, to become more universal. And what we do, we have to, to make sure that what we do has that dimension, is, is directed in that direction, is on the art of ascent. We have to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to get involved in prejudices and in ignorant activities and so forth. And Baha'u'llah said, be thou as a throbbing artery pulsating in the body, body of the entire creation. That through the heat generated by the motion, by this motion, there may appear that which will quicken the hearts of those who hesitate. In other words, through our thoughts, through our sentiments, through our actions as Baha'i, we have to be able to to develop that capacity so that not only our thoughts, feelings, and actions transform ourselves, but also creates the necessary uh, environment, the necessary mo motive power for other people to see it to recognize it, to see, to become curious, to wonder how come this person can live in this chaotic world, in this state of assurance and optimism and positive action? How come a, in a world that is totally divided, a community can be created, extremely diverse in every sense of the word, that is united, is free from violence, is totally trustworthy, is pursuing justice, and is dedicated to service of humanity in a condition of unity and diversity, which is the example of the Baha'i community. You see, the Baha'i community is a very interesting phenomenon. In the Baha'i community, if you look at it from panorama, panoramic perspective, it's really beautiful. Okay? It's when you get close to it that you see all kinds of wrinkles. You know, it's, a, it's the same thing about, uh, you know, the way we look, you know. If we look far, we look good. When we go close, <laughs> we need to change, okay? So that's the nature of transformation in the Baha'i community. As individuals, we all have to transform and change and so forth. But to the degree that we have put the writings of the Baha'i faith into action, and brought it into operation in our lives, individual, family, community lives. To that degree, we become attractive. Okay. So, so this is the arc of ascent that then we go on. And it is through this process that we develop greater and greater measures of spirituality.
spirituality in the Baha'i faith is conscious knowledge combined with meritorious action in the context of unity. I think that's sufficient for tonight. Anyway, dear friends, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very